about love. It's such a beautiful time of the month. And if you're like me, you hear a theme, you're like, God, where are you going with this? Because you started with supernatural rest, right? And so the whole time this month, I've been expecting, you know, the prosperity <laughs> and the money and all that stuff. So I was like, yes, supernatural rest. Woo. <laughs> And then it's like the year, you know, shout of Jubilee. Like, okay, okay, I, can, I get that. I can get that with that. And you got like the new name, righteousness, beauty, mercy, grace, love. And you're like, okay, Lord, what is, what is this? <laughs> What's that got to do with supernatural rest? And, I <laughs> and it's beautiful. It's all beautiful theme. And then you hear about casting out Jezebel and all that stuff. I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going, I'm flowing with you, but... How does this tie to supernatural rest? And, you know, it's just the Lord's ministry to me. It's like when you're about to enter a new place as you are going to a new ground, you've got to put clear all that old stuff, the fields. And it's like we need to come into a new understanding because if we just came and they put us in the same place with the same old garbage that we were carrying, we would not be able to sustain that rest. And as God is taking us into this month of soup and this year and this season of supernatural rest, it's like I want to come into a new level of love, a new, a deeper understanding of love. This love that transcends human knowledge, human thoughts, human emotions, human everything. This love of God that never fails, that is steadfast, that is rooted. And for you to come into understanding of why you must need this love to carry you into this new season that you're in. In the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 to 10, we can see here, um, you know, that God, everything that God does, I mean everything, I started to think about it, everything that God does is love, from love. I will be reading mostly from the NLT, so if we have that, that would be great. The New Living Translation, except otherwise mentioned, it was love, everything born from love. And I'll read. It says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so you might have eternal life through him. And verse 10, he says, this is real love. This is real love. First, God showed us his love. He demonstrated his love. It's like, you know, and I was thinking about this scripture again. I was like, God, it's like, this, how, how did he demonstrate his love? It's like, I gave you my son, okay? First, your sins are forgiven because with sin, you cannot enjoy the goodness and the beauty of God, right? You can't enjoy all the blessings, the prosperity, and all this stuff. But it's like also that you might partake and you might be, you can be like Jesus, and I started to think about it. I was like, if a billionaire had 70 billion right now, and they were like, they could, they could be like, I can give one billion, and you'd be happy. He'd be like, whoo, I got one billion from like the richest person in the world. But then it's like, I watch more. If they're like, you know, my son is going to inherit all of this. I want you to inherit everything as well as my son. So I want to put you in the same level as my son so that you inherit instead of one billion, you're inheriting a $70 billion, you know, asset that he has. And God is like, how much more will I show you my love by when I give you my son so that you can partake of everything that is Christ? So when we are talking about love, we must see in why do I need this love of God? We're talking about love. Why is it important? Why must I pursue it? Why must I activate it? Because it says the love is already given to us by the Holy Spirit. And right now, we just felt a beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit. And he came here again to activate that love in us. So it's like, how would you, you have to allow the Holy Spirit to activate it in you. But if you're not aware, if you're not excited about love, if you're not eager for it, you will not know the importance of activating it. Amen. I love, like, Paul. I was reading about, about Paul. I remember I mentioned in prayer, she's like, it's like, Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, he's going around the whole world. He's doing all these miracles. He's doing all this stuff. And he's like, what is my reason? Love compels me. That's an NIV bar. You can read LLT. LLT says, love controls me. 
KJV says, love constrains me. Love, I do this because of love. I go to save souls. I want people to be delivered and set free because of this love. And that same love has already flown from, the, from God to Holy Spirit and is in us even right now as we speak. And, you know, I think of a message Mr. Mr. Lori gave last week. It was so wonderful, so well delivered, so powerful. It's on YouTube again, and so just listen to it. And another scripture that we've read is Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm just kind of like, because of time, I'm going to... Uh, go, you're going to go into it. So if you start from verse 2 to 6, and if we quickly read there, please. Um, from 2 to 6, Apostle Paul is telling the Ephesians, it's like, you know, there's a mystery I came into. I came into this new revelation. And what is it? That you will be heirs joined together. If you can group them together, that would be great. I'm not really reading it. Um, Okay, let's read it because of time. I assume, by the way, that you know God gave him the special responsibility of extending his grace uh, to the Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read from what I've written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to the previous generation, but now the Spirit is revealed it to his only apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan that both Gentiles and Jews will believe the good news, amen, share equally in the riches narrated by God's children, both as part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. Why did I read the scripture? It's very important to understand why. It's like, this is the mystery. This is God's plan that you might enjoy the inheritance of Christ Gentiles and Jews equally. But it's like, but you're going to need something to do that. In verse 14, I pray this prayer. I pray this prayer. The first that, you know, it's like, if you, uh, first, let's go to verse 14. I make this prayer that when I fall to my knees, I pray to my father, verse uh, 15. When I, let's just go to verse 16, sorry. Okay. And I pray from this glorious unlimited resources that I empower you with what strength through your spirit, one. And then two, that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith. But then you be rooted and grounded in love. So it's like for you to enjoy all these things, yes, you need strength, you need faith, but you need that love. But he didn't just say love, he said rooted and grounded in love. I said a thing about roots. What does roots mean? And... I was like, okay, for a tree, I, I don't know if you, let me give you some things that I found out about roots. Sometimes a tree, the root is two times bigger than a tree. So if you see a really big tree, sometimes the root is actually bigger, twice, two times. That's why sometimes when you're trying to struggle to get some stubborn weeds out, you know, you need a bigger machine to get it out. Because sometimes it's two or three times. And it's saying that, but out of roots as well, the nutrients that the tree needs to blossom, to grow, they come from the roots. Everything, the food it needs, everything that it needs comes from the, from the tree. So, just to recap, it's saying that when love is your root, when you're firmly in love and rooted in love, every part of you is flowing love like God. So God, everything God does is love. Because the all is essence, it's part of him, is love. So God is like, when you're rooted in my love, in me, everything flows from there. So why does it have to be love? We have 10 things and the Lord give us strength to go through things, <laughs> go through them. But if not, you know, he will go through the next step. Amen. We know that love is from the heart. So God, God is like, right now, he's been clearing things in our heart. So all the, you know, I love Mr. Elora Shane, all the things that would hinder your heart, the hardness and the poison, so you can understand and say, Lord, I grab something that I love. So number one, why love? It is the essence of life. Love is the power and the tonic of life. 
says, without love, you are not living. Anywhere there is no love, it is dying, there is no life. You know, have you seen, I know if you've ever seen videos or documentaries of children that you know grew up in love, what happens to them? Many of them die physically, yes, but also mentally, emotionally, spiritually, right? And then when they come to Christ, God has to revive them with a new love. There is no life when there's, there is no love. Nothing works without love. There is no church, no relationship, no uh, nothing really that works without love. If you've ever seen those workplace, people are just kind of like, they're just existing. And a workplace is one of the most places you see that the most lifeless people. People are existing. They're just kind of like going through the motions because the love for that job or for, the, for that thing is gone. You see, you can see a big assembly. It doesn't matter how big the assembly is, how big the church is. If there is no love, you're a workplace. You're an organization. You're functioning with organized things, but the root is there's no love. And so when the enemy wants to come, he can just come, whoosh, scatter, gone. Gone. Like, people are gone because... When love is not at its roots, it's not founded on love, nothing is there. And Satan loves that atmosphere. He enjoys it. He doesn't mind, he doesn't mind for you to grow if you know there's no love because anytime he can come and sneak in and sneak out, sneak in and sneak out, but that's not our portion. So we must desire love and say, Lord, feel me. Let me activate this love. The love is already in there. Let it grow. Let it grow. Amen. You also enjoy your life. Many people that you see, when, when, when there's uh, people feeling going through depression and all that stuff, you see that love is missing. And if you ever do those tests from um, of a suicide test, you know, they, they gauge your level of depression with, with also your family as well. I don't know if Mr. Laurie can kind of elaborate, but I kind of did a study where it was like they will ask you, what is going to keep you from committing suicide? And they'll be like, is it your family? Right? <laughs> like, they're gonna be like, what, what is it? Because if, sorry, what connections? Because they're like, if it's not there, then you're a danger. And that's in the world. I'm much more in Christ. I'm a, I mean, it's gonna mature. Love revives anything, it is refreshing and renews anything, anything that is dying or is dead, love can revive it. I was just thinking about this. I was thinking of my grass. God, anyone who's going to my house, I can see my grass. I think it's 95% weed and 95% grass because I didn't nurture it. I didn't take care of it. I was just cutting it because, you know, we started with, when we first moved, we saw one down the line. We're like, eh, it's okay. Next <laughs> the next season it was like two, three. I'm like, where did it come from? I just kind of gave up. I'm like, just cut, just cut it. Now I cut weed. I don't cut the grass. <laughs> and, but you know what? For that to grow, because there's still some grass there, I would need to nurture it, put some, you know, put, you know, put the right seed, the right soil, tender it, and water it again. That's love. Love does that. When something is dying, when there's the atmosphere in the home is dying, or a church, or an assembly, like what God is doing in our midst, he's reviving love. He's like, I'm going to bring love in there and inject it again so that you can have energy. And inject it again so that life can spring forth, so that more grass can come forth, so that there'll be more word, there'll be more life in you. So if there's something that is dying or is dead, love can revive that. That's why we must go for that love because one, it's already shared in your heart by the Holy Spirit. But like Mr. Lord was sharing last time, it's like some things can cut it, can kill them. But that's why you first get rid of like, you know, the weed. They tell you first to get rid of the weeds first and they start to pour. Pour love, pour love so you can grow. Number three, love is stronger than death. Songs of Solomon chapter 8, verse 6 to 7. And I'll read. It says, place me like a seal over my heart. Let it see, like a seal on my heart. For love is as strong as death. 
is jealous is enduring as the grave. Love flashes like fire. And this verse, verse 7, it says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. Let me stop there. I was like, many love waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. It is stronger than that. I started thinking about the different waters. I said, okay, we have streams, springs, uh, you know, falls. We have rivers. Then we have seas, oceans. And it goes like, and I was thinking about it's an intensified. The water intensifies, right? Some is a stream, a little stream there. And some is an ocean of affliction. And it's a stream of affliction. But it's like, it doesn't matter what the water is, it cannot be quenched. It cannot quench love. That means affliction cannot quench your love. No matter the affliction you face, love cannot be quenched. When it is working in you, when it's operating in you, that love is stronger than what you face. It is stronger than death. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 and 38 and 39. We know the scripture, and, it, and you know, it says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Can it? <laughs> it's like, can it be, is it trouble? Is it calamity? Is it persecution? Is it hunger? Is it destitute? Is it danger? Can it be threatened with death? Verse 38 and 39. He says, I am convinced. KJV is like, I am persuaded that nothing can separate us. No death, neither death, nor life, neither angels or demons, neither fears for the day or worries about tomorrow, not about the powers of hell can separate us from the love. No power in the sky above and the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all the creation can ever ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. I just love that. It's like the breakdown. You're like, oh my God. No death. No life. No angels. No demon. No principalities. No powers. Nothing can separate it from us, from God's love. Hallelujah. Yes, let's clap for the Lord. Let's clap for the Lord. So when love is operating, it's an antidote to affliction, to backsliding. Because you're like, you know what, Lord, no matter what, I know nothing can separate me. No matter what I'm facing, no matter what we're seeing, nothing, 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 nothing. And even if that situation is dead, God can revive it because of his love. Hallelujah. Number four, without love, everything dies. You know, I was thinking about this. Like every war that we see right now, let's just give an example, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, you know, do you know that actually I think um, Ukraine and Russia are actually separated? So many of them actually speak, there's a part of people who are in, in Ukraine who actually speak Russian, right? And there are many people who actually have a father who is Russian, a mother who is Ukrainian, and vice versa. That's a practical example of love breakdown. Brothers and sisters fighting. Yes, you can mention many things, you know, it's NATO was trying to come in, there's this and that, there's oil. Okay, but the root is love is gone. And so because there's no love among brethren, Satan came in create a war. We see that right now, even like, you no, know, let's take away from the war. Siblings fighting from the same father, same mother. They've not seen eye to eye because there's no love. We've heard of people killing their parents to get inheritance because there's no love. When love is not operating, it's darkness. It says hatred goes with darkness. The opposite of love is hatred and is darkness. First John chapter 2 verse 9 to 11. He says, if anyone claims I am living in the light but hates a fellow brethren, a believer, that person is still living in darkness. 
Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. And he says, such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by darkness. When there's hatred in someone, God is saying, like, there's no light in you. It doesn't matter if you love person A, but as long as you hate person B, there is still no light in you. Love is not, it's not partial. It's not like I love part people and I hate the rest of the people. It's like if there is still that part of you in there, no love. There's still darkness and it's blinding you. And God is like, I'm, today as you come into Revelation, let that love set you free from being blinded in Jesus' name. Amen. And it's because of love. It says we preach whatever you preach. You do it in love. If you're doing it without love, it's nothing. It's not going anywhere. There's no fruit from it. Because all of God, all God's being is love. All of him, all of him. It's like from the root up is love. Can we show a picture of the root? I believe we have it, the tree. You don't have it? Okay, I was trying to show a picture. And I wanted to show how deep it was going. I was like, oh, Lord. And it's like as it springs forth, you see, you, everyone sees the tree. Like, oh, tree is so gorgeous. Like, how green it is. But what it is, the nutrients that God is saying is like, is love when it's flowing. Amen. Let's go to, actually, we're going to skip number five and go into so much, Lord. Um, thank you, Lord. Okay. Let's go into love grows and it flows. Love is designed to grow and it's designed to flow. Love, where it grows, there's no matter what the obstacle, it's meant to grow, it's meant to flow. However, love can be limited, it can be unused, it can be stagnant, because one, there are many things that hinder love, and this is where we're going to focus on in the last few minutes. A, what limits love from growing and flowing? Number one is traditions and culture. Many people are holding on dearly for their life, for the culture and the tradition. Got black culture, white culture, every, every kind of culture in this world. And they're holding on for their lives. But God's like, that's an enemy. Let's go to Mark chapter 7. And if we go to first, uh, verse 13. Mark 7, 13. And I'll read. And it says, Making the word of God of none effect. NLT says, so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. You are canceling the word of God when you want to hand down your own tradition. Let's go from actually verse 7 to 10. And God here is saying, I mean, just was saying actually, he was like, you're ignoring God's law and you substitute your own tradition. And you said, and he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. Verse 10 says, Moses gave you a law from God. Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disres disrespectfully of father or mother shall be put to death. But you say it is all right for people to say to their, to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to God to give what I would have given to you. I was laughing because I was like, because, you know, KJV was like, you mentioned, you mentioned cabron, cabron something, cabron, cabron. I was like, what does that mean? And here, they are using a legitimate reason for why they're not going to give to their parents or honor their parents. I got to give to God so I can give to you. I cannot honor you or respect you. And God is like, you brought your tradition. And he says, you skilled fully sidestep. God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. You wanted to do your own thing, so you manipulated using your tradition because you wanted to hold on to your culture, because you want to hold on to your religion. That's what limits love, tradition. Let's go to verse B. It says the Pharisees, the Pharisees could not, they couldn't understand love because they were doctors, scribes, all these big names. 
But they couldn't understand love because what is that? Everything that Jesus did came from love. Number B is laws and regulation and, or regimens. They are bound by the law and the rules in their heart. They were bound by it. And you, see, you hear some people, they're like, in their mind, they're like, you know what? It's so easy. I'm going to pray for the sick. It's so easy. If, so, if someone came right now, you're like, I'm going to pray for the sick. You're like, yes, let's pray for the sick. But are you praying for, sorry, Taisha, beside you? Do you think of your brother beside you? But it's so easy for your food because it's like legalistic. It's better for me to pray for the poor and the rich. But, you know, it's better for me to give to the poor. But I can't give to my pastors because my mind is like rules and, and regulations and, and mindset. I was thinking about this. I was like, God did not say give. He said, of course, he said give to the poor. He says give and it shall be given unto you. He didn't say give only to the poor and it shall be given to you. He says give. So that means even if someone is wealthier than you, you give. But if you have laws and regulations in your mind, you, you're going to be like, you're going to struggle with that. C is offense and bitterness. And for reference, you can go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. That's for regulations. Um, offenses, it kills. Bitterness kills. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. And let's just read the KJV version. It's, it, it hardens the heart. It poisons the heart. I'm going to stop, stop it actually. It's like, because love is meant to grow and to flow. But when you have offense and you have bitterness, it stops it. It says... Look diligently, lest any man fall of the grace, fail of the grace of God. Lest the root of bitterness spring up, troubling you and defiles you. Bitterness, offense, defiles the heart. It poisons the heart. Again, YouTube, Mr. Lori did a good job, wonderful job. So let's thank God for her. Amen. That's why we must go for love this month and this season. Because we want love to grow. We want it to flow in you. You don't want to be stopped by all these things. I'll give you this one and then we'll go. Number eight is fellowship and connection. The conduct of love is fellowship and connection. And the enemy of fellowship and connection is distance, separation, division, and offenses. Well, division, sorry. If you know, it's in long distance relationships, sometimes the love fades after a while, so they have to do a lot more to nourish it. But why? why? Why separation, distance, all of this? Because the enemy is attacking your love. And love is tied to unity, and unity is tied to your blessings. That's Psalms 133, verse 1 to 3. I believe someone else will continue this, but I just want us to understand why we must go for love this month, why we must pursue it. I say, God, I thank you for your love. I'm enjoying your love. I'm flowing in your love. I'm activating this love so that all this can work in my life, so that life can flow, so I can enjoy my life. But also all the traditions, the offenses, the bitterness will no longer have a root in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.